which is Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And let's go through. And by God's grace, let's read these things and find out what the Lord has for us today. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. <clears throat> and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. That is Jesus' description of what it means to be blessed. I apologize. I know you can hear me sniffling a little bit. I've got a two-year-old at home, and she's in daycare. And I walked into the daycare on Monday, and Sophia was fine. But I looked around, and I think seven of ten little children were sniffling like I am now today. And I said, this child is going to be, she is a cute, adorable, bouncy, playful, germ-generating factory. <laughs> and I said to myself, because for whatever reason, uh, I think I've gotten older with my younger daughter, with my older daughter, when she got sick, she's now almost 16, I didn't get sick that much, now that I'm closer to 50 than to 30, uh, I think my immune system is, uh, has taken a turn south. So my little girl, I looked at that and I said, I am gonna be dealing with something because she wants nothing more than to hug you and breathe into your face when she is sick. And so I apologize. It's a very, very minor baby cold. I tend to be getting them, it seems, on a, on a bi-weekly cycle at this point. But uh, I apologize. I know I am a little congested. All right. How does Jesus, in these verses, describe the beatitude, the supreme blessing? Do not miss this. What he says is poverty, mourning, Hunger, thirst, conflict, and persecution is the life of the blessed. That's why it is that when Jesus got to the end, it wasn't that he said things that sounded crazy. He said them with authority, not like the scribes and the priests. And the people were astonished because when you begin your recruitment speech, to be clear, he's trying to bring them into the kingdom of God. He wants them to become followers of him. And he begins by saying, the blessed life is poverty and mourning and hunger and thirst and conflict and persecution. Come and join me for this. Invitation. Now this morning, there are two great reversals. And the first is just this, that Jesus turns the idea of beatitude, exalted happiness and supreme blessing. He turns it on its head. That's the first of the two reversals that we're going to talk about today. When you are looking at these qualities, what you have to recognize is these are not eight separate qualities that a Christian should possess. Perhaps seeking a little bit of purity and a little bit of peacemaking, but I'll pass on the persecution. Thank you very much. These are a description of what every Christian is to be. And what is more and what's important to recognize, Ellen White brings this out very clearly in, in, in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, is that each beatitude builds on the one before it. A Christian's mourning, the second beatitude, is the result of his is, uh, is a result of his poverty of spirit, the first beatitude. Let's take a look at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit. Spiritual bankruptcy. The knowledge that when it comes to God, I have not one thing in my account that I bring to him. I have nothing good to recommend myself to him. I am spiritually bankrupt. A selfish, 
evil, wretched, grasping creature, incapable of wanting good, much less doing good. Now, what you'll note is I said I am, because I don't want to offend you, but just to be clear, you are too. That's you too. That is a description, we say of the human condition, and that kind of puts it a little step away. That, that, that oh, the human condition, it's a little bit away from me if I say the human, no it is not, it is a description of you. You need to be poor in spirit to recognize the fact that you are spiritually bankrupt. That knowledge, that when the Bible describes all of my righteousness as filthy rags, that's not poetry. That's an accurate description of the best that you have to offer, filthy rags. It's more dictionary than poetry. It is the understanding that if I take the best thing that I have ever done in my life, the most unselfish and loving thing that I have ever done, and then I presented that thing to God, that God would justly condemn me for that best thing that I ever did. Because I have nothing good in me, I have nothing good that I can present to him. That is the first step in the Beatitudes. Spiritual bankruptcy. Now, can I just point out the fact that this is also a description of righteousness by faith? Righteousness by faith states that because we have nothing good of our own to offer, it is only our faith in the goodness of another which allows us to have any righteousness of our own. So Jesus actually begins the Beatitudes with a very short, very succinct description of righteousness by faith. All right. You see yourself now as spiritually bankrupt, nothing good to offer, selfish, corrupt. What is the effect of that revelation on a person? You are going to be led to more. That's the second beatitude. Blessed are they which mourn, for they shall be comforted. Do you remember Daniel's response? Daniel chapter 10, when the angel came down to him, Daniel chapter 10. There remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned into corruption. He saw himself as he was, and he said, and I, ret and I retain no strength. This is our response to seeing ourselves as we actually are, and to seeing God as he actually is. We mourn our spiritual bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. We mourn our corruption and our filth. Now we ask the question, all right, having seen our spiritual bankruptcy, having mourned our condition, what effect does this produce in a person? Blessed are the meek. Now, meekness is sometimes misunderstood. We think meekness is humility. Meekness is humility taken to the next step. Humility is not to think more of yourself than you should. Meekness is what that means in your dealings with another person. It means to be calm and accepting when you are provoked. It means to be kind when you are attacked or oppressed. When the Bible says Moses was the meekest man in the world, it's not saying he was the most humble man in the world, although probably he was. It means when you look at the way those people treated him, and God said, I'm so tired of these people. Let me wipe them off the face of the earth, and I will build another nation on you. When Moses said, no, block, don't just kill me. Take me out of the book of life. That was the picture of meekness, seeking good to those who provoke. So how does spiritual bankruptcy and mourning lead to meekness? You see, when you see yourself as you really are, you will learn to be patient with another person's weakness and failures. We get angry with other people because we think we deserved better from them and we think that we would be better to them than they have been to us. But when we see that both of these things are untrue, 
We learn patience and meekness when provoked by another person. Our understanding of what we are helps us to be kind to other people when they treat us poorly. One more thing. Remember when Jesus said, when your enemy slaps you, turn the other cheek, offer the other cheek to him, and we think that that's meekness. Can I be honest with you? That's not the main operation of meekness. You see, meekness rather presents itself in our families. The enemy that comes up and slaps you is not something that happens very often. But it is our families that test our patience every day. If you think I don't have a lot of opportunity to exercise meekness, I'm telling you, you must be living on an island. There can be no people around you if you feel like you have no opportunity to exercise meekness. And make no mistake, they try your patience, well, I promise you, you try theirs too. Ask any husband about a wife and get an honest answer, and then ask any wife about a husband to get an honest answer. And you will find that healthy marriages are the result of tremendous meekness on the part of both parties. When we say that the ground is level at the cross, this is another side of what that means. We are all equally guilty before him. And when we come to recognize this, it is amazing the depths of kindness that it can produce to those who may not, in our mind, deserve it. But when we come to see ourselves as we are, we find out that if we expect kindness from God, we must offer it to others as well. So you see yourself as you really are, and you want to be something better. What does this do? It creates in you a hunger and a thirsting for something that you do not possess. And that thing is righteousness. You have nothing good in yourself. You see this and you want, by God's grace, to be something other than what you are. Like a man in the desert, thirsty, seeking water. You search desperately for something to drink. You desire to be something other than what you are, other than what you know yourself to be. And the illustration of thirst and hunger is helpful in another way as well. You see, if you are thirsty, you don't have anything that you can make better in yourself to quench your thirst. You cannot develop within yourself some water to quench your thirst. The thing has to come from the outside. You need something outside of yourself to quench your thirst. If you want righteousness, the problem is you have none. But Jesus has an abundance, and the gospel says he's offered that thing to you. His righteousness is offered to you, and if you hunger and you thirst for it, what the scripture says here is you will be filled. That means Jesus will give to you the righteousness that you desire. He will give you himself. Amen. That's what the scripture teaches. Amen. Amen. Now, having seen all this, what then does this do when you're actually put in a position of some power over another human being? Now, to be clear, you think you have no power? Yes, you do. You have children. You have people around you. You have waitresses that might serve you. You have people who are under you all the time. You do not need to be Elon Musk at Tesla and feel like that's the only person who has people under him. You have people under you all the time. If you have children, if you have parents who are now past the age where they're taking care of you and you're now at the age where you're taking care of them, you will treat them with mercy. Do you know what mercy is defined as? Mercy is defined in the dictionary as compassion toward an enemy or someone who's under your power. So how will you treat those who have offended and hurt you and frustrated you now that you have some power over them? You will treat them with mercy, just like you receive mercy for doing worse things to God than they ever did to you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. They shall show mercy to their brethren, and they shall receive mercy, both in this life and in the life to come. Remember God's relationship with us. Romans 5 and verse 8. While we were enemies of God. Remember how Romans, the progression says, while we were weak, 
while we were sinners. And then finally it says, while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God at the cost of the death of his son. When you're merciful, what does that mean? The only way to be merciful, that is a purely godly characteristic. Jesus Christ must be revealed to the soul for any mercy to be shown. We see his mercy extended to us, and then we extend some of that same in our own small way to those around us. So having seen God, having seen his mercy toward you, having experienced that, the revelation of God, you extend mercy toward other people. You've hungered and thirsted for righteousness, and he's filled you with it. So then he finally gives you one other thing. When you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, do you think purity of heart might be a part of that? How many of you, don't raise your hand, how many of you have a hard time controlling your thoughts? Right? It's not just the teenage boys. It's all of us. You do not graduate from that as a challenge. You will become pure in heart just like they, excuse me, just like Jesus is pure in heart. It's interesting. He says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. But it's only by seeing God that you can possibly be pure in heart. There's a back and forth in this. Having seen your soul bankruptcy, wanting and received righteousness and purity of heart, what will then be the effect that you have on the people around you? You will become a peacemaker. Just as God made peace between you and him, you will seek to make peace between your brethren and between them and you. Even between others, nothing to do with you who are fighting amongst themselves. You will seek peace wherever it can be found. How many of you have co-workers who thrive on conflict? Who plant seeds of discord everywhere they go? Life is a zero-sum game to them. They figure the more miserable everyone else is, the more happiness there is for them. You've seen people like this. You work with them. That is the exact opposite of what Jesus is talking about here. People who go about causing problems everywhere they go, sowing seeds of discontent everywhere they go. Oh, did you hear that such and such said so and so about you? You will rather be seeking to find peace between brethren, peace between you and them. You will do that as a result of everything that was in him. Just as God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, so God will be in you, reconciling his children to you, to each other, and to God. That is what it means to be a peacemaker. And now at the end of all this, Jesus is talking about the development of a character. You have seen yourself spiritually bankrupt. You've mourned your condition. You are now meek. You're pure in heart. You're seeking to be a peacemaker. So the world will then become your friend. No, it will not. Jesus says the inevitable result of the development of a right character is persecution. Because the world that hated him is not going to treat you better when you become like him. Ellen White says something remarkable. Great Controversy, page 48, last paragraph. She says, many wonder in the world today why it is that persecution seems largely to rest. There's no persecution. She basically says it's because Christians are living such weak and powerless lives that they do not so much as raise the ire of the enemy. The enemy now ignores us because he's simply not threatened. She says, but if we go back to the kind of godliness that the church had in the times when it was persecuted, she says the fires of persecution would raise up just as hot and just as high as they ever did. The inevitable result Amen. of living godly in Christ Jesus is persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12, all, not many, not most, not some, all, 
who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And although I say it gently, I will say it. If there's no persecution in your life, maybe it's because you're not showing anyone that you're for Jesus. Period. Now, so what does persecution say? Well, Jesus says here in verse 12, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Remember, Peter and the apostles, Acts chapter 5, brought before the Sanhedrin. They said they're beaten, and as they were leaving that place, they said they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. That's verse 41. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. So now we can see what it is that Ellen White alluded to in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. The Beatitudes are a description of a person's character. They are a description of the way that we should be. But you see, there's yet a deeper level to these Beatitudes. And I want to talk for just a minute about what that deeper level is before we get to the final great reversal. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. There is a word that is used in Matthew more than in any of the other Gospels, more than in any other book in the Scripture. Do you know what that word is in Matthew that is used more than anything else? Who was Matthew written for? It was written for the Jews. And the word that is used over and over again in the book of Matthew is the word fulfilled. As it was written in the prophets, thus it was fulfilled. As it was written in the law, thus it was fulfilled. fulfilled. Thus it was fulfilled. Thus it was fulfilled. So Matthew lays out something in the beginning that a lot of the time we miss. Let me remind you of a story from the Old Testament. And I want you to be putting the New Testament light to this story. There was a man named Joseph, great-grandson of Abraham. Joseph had dreams, and as a result of these dreams, he went down to Egypt. He spent some time in Egypt with his family, and then after that, he was called by God to return to Canaan. The first great obstacle that the descendants of Joseph faced as they were coming back to Canaan was a passing through the Red Sea. After passing through the Red Sea, they passed through the wilderness of Sin. And then after that, they came to a mountain called Sinai, where they received the law. Matthew tells a different story, but all the same touch points. A man named Joseph, Mary's husband, father figure to Jesus, has a dream. That dream says, Herod's going to kill the child, go down to Egypt. He went down to Egypt until he received another dream saying, now go back. Hmm. He came back. That's Matthew. That's the early chapters in Matthew. Now, in Matthew chapter 3, in the Old Testament, they came to the obstacle, which was the Red Sea, and God parted the Red Sea. But in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus also goes under the water, and he is baptized. After the Red Sea, they carry them into the wilderness, and just like Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted 40 days and 40 nights of the devil. After this, that's Matthew chapter 4, Jesus then climbs a mountain and lays down the principles of God's kingdom, the principles of God's law, in the same way that Moses did with God on Sinai in Exodus. There's complete overlap here. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but the Ten Commandments are a transcript of the character of God rightly understood. They are not a list of do's and don'ts. They tell us about God. God is holy. Do not have other gods before him. God is holy and just and good. Do not take his name in vain. Honor your mother and your father is the only way that you can possibly figure out how to honor God. Do not murder as God is the life giver. Do not steal as God gives unstintingly, generously to his people. Do not covet as God seeks only to bless. Each and every one of these, rightly understood, is a description of the character of God. And that's where it starts on Sinai. But when you're looking at Jesus here, Jesus is not simply describing the character that he wants you to have. He's describing the character that he has. Amen. 
Amen, amen. When you look at the Ten Commandments, you are describing a God that habitat that whose habitat who inhabits eternity and sits on a throne in heaven. When you are looking at the Beatitudes, you are looking at a God who the qualities that he took as a savior. What do I mean? Blessed are the poor in spirit. In heaven, Jesus was rich in every spiritual blessing. Angels adored him. But for our sake, he became poor. Daily, he had to seek from his father what in heaven he never did. He had to seek daily strength, daily wisdom. And at the cross, he took all the sins of the world. You see, he never sinned himself. But all the sins of the world rendered him spiritually bankrupt when he took them upon himself. Has anyone ever mourned, and specifically mourned for sin, in the way that Jesus did? Has any human being ever said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God's never forsaken a human being other than one, one time on the cross. We know that Jesus on the cross could not see the light through the other end of the, of the tunnel. As he endured the cross, the joy that was set before him carried him. He despised the shame. The sin of the world lay upon him, and he died. Jesus mourned for sin. Was there ever anyone meeker than Jesus? Did ever an enemy do more against a person than Jesus' enemies did to him, and was ever that afflicted, beaten person meeker than Jesus was. He did not open his mouth like a sheep led to the slaughter. He did not open his mouth. The Bible describes, uh, excuse me, Moses as the meekest man that ever lived. Jesus was meeker still. Jesus hungered and thirsted for righteousness. It was his daily bread to do the will of his Father. He sought that righteousness with all of his being, and because he did that, that's why you and I can be filled. Do I even need to say anything about Jesus' mercy? Do I need to say anything about his purity of heart? It was mercy that pulled him out of heaven to come to this dark place, to give his life a ransom for many. It was his purity that shined through in his every interaction with the people around him. And pure as he was, have you ever noticed how no one ever felt condemned for their sin in the presence of his purity? They were not left to feel condemned. They were left to marvel that one so pure would love one so corrupt. That was mercy and purity of heart for Jesus. Has there ever been a greater peacemaker? There's only one reason you have peace with God. It's because Jesus is the greatest peacemaker that's ever been. He built the bridge that bridged the gap between your sin and God's holiness. Your spiritual bankruptcy and God's perfection was bridged by him. Jesus made peace between us and God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. He made us the children of God, just as he is a son of God. And Jesus was persecuted. More than any human being has ever been persecuted. But he was not persecuted for any wrong that he ever did. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He was persecuted as much more than any other human being has ever been persecuted, as he was more pure than any human being has ever been. He was beaten and he was oppressed, and by his stripes we are healed. Amen. So when we look at the character that God is describing as blessed, do not miss this. Jesus is describing himself. Amen. The Beatitudes are not just a list of good qualities for us to have. They are a description of the one who spoke them in the first place. But there is one final reversal, one last great reversal that we must consider. 
before we leave the Beatitudes. You see, for each one of the blessings that Jesus lists that we would struggle to want, blessings of poverty and of conflict, blessings of mourning and persecution, we don't want them. You see, following these is a blessing that we would very much like to have. You see, for each difficult, blessed are that in the Beatitudes, there is a much easier for theirs is. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Tough to want that. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Easy to want that. Blessed are they that mourn. Hard to want that. For they shall be comforted. We all want that. We want the kingdom of God and to be comforted. We want to inherit the earth and to be filled. We want to receive mercy, to see God, and to be called the children of God. In Jesus' promise that we'll have all of these things, but the great reversal is this. We receive these things because Jesus did not. The blessings and promises are ours because they were denied to him. We have the kingdom of God because he left it to come down and die for our sins. We are comforted because he on the cross had none to comfort him. Not the priests, not the crowds, not his disciples, not even his own father who forsook him in the hour of his greatest need. We will inherit the earth because he became the scum of it. We will be filled because he was empty. We will receive mercy because he received none. When he cried out, none responded. There was no mercy for him on the cross, just sour wine. We shall see God and be called the children of God because the Son of God could not see him on that cross. He was abandoned so that we might be adopted. He was forsaken so that we might be accepted. The kingdom of, of heaven is ours with all of these exceeding blessings, all of these beatitudes, because the earth, with all of its hatred and corruption, was his. He took it all. The whole idea that I've tried to share here, I don't think can be... Can be explained any more clearly than Ellen White actually did in the book Desire of Ages, 25th page. If you were to ask me what is my favorite Ellen White quote, this might be it. I, I would have a hard time. There's a few of them, but this, is, this may be it. Desire of Ages, page 25. Remember what we've said. Christ was treated as we deserve. <laughs> that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. And with his stripes we are healed. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Open your handbooks on page 522. My hope is built and nothing less. And with the pianist that's ready, I can't sing, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm like Dr. Boyle. I'm, I can't I can't sing. <laughs>
Father, as we leave this place, help us to carry with us, Lord, this picture that we've received today of the character and the goodness, the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. Help us to develop characters pleasing to you, that we might meet you on the sea of glass when you come. Be with us as we go from this place. Let us never leave your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 That was good. Thank you so much and have a blessed Sabbath.